Hello, everybody. Uh, we're back. I'm Chris Kreicho. This is Dan Freeman. Look, we have we have words over our ourselves and a nicer screen set up, and it's just been a day. <laughs> we're figuring this out. All things as we go. You wouldn't believe how much work this is. But hey, we're getting better at it. So we're back. Last time we talked about the template transform, I had to think about it for a minute. We talked about the template transform and we got through talking about helpers and modifiers. And then we looked at the clock and said, it's been about an hour and components are complicated. So let's do that next time. And here we are next time, but it's only been a day. So we don't have any mailbag questions. So we're just going to jump in. So Dan, you ready? Yep. Let's do it. Sweet. Um, so Screen. we are back in our familiar demo.gts. <laughs> Hello and, again, demo. <laughs> uh, and once again, I haven't really thought ahead beyond like big picture, here are the topics we should hit. So I don't have anything prepped, which I probably should have at least given <laughs> component. Uh, there, there's always our good old greet component, or yeah, say hi, same difference. Yeah. This is the one. Uh, there we go, okay. So this is exactly what was there before, only we've made it more complicated. Um, the best. Yeah, pretty much. And because we're not doing anything with arcs or blocks or anything, we don't even need to bother dealing with the signature here, which is, I think, useful to start with. Mm -hmm. So let's dive right in and look at our IR. Uh, say hi. We've seen this template before. We've already done it. The only difference here mm -hmm. is that we're assigning it to a const instead of exporting it. Um, down here, we have our familiar resolve call, and then we have a call to emit component. First, let's stop in at resolve and see, just like we did before, what we're actually yeah. doing back here. Oops. And as, as noted previously, there's no args to it, because there's no args to it. So it's just exactly. the resolve call with an empty, empty call after that. Yep. So if we look at what high is, high is a function, like everything else we're always going to get back from resolve. And it gives us back this thing called component return. And you may remember last time we saw a thing called modifier return. And this is going to look a lot like that, except that the thing you get back when you invoke a component, you can do more stuff with. Mm -hmm. A modifier, all you can really do is stick it on an element. And even the act of figuring out what element you're sticking it to happens as part of invoking it. Whereas when we invoke a component, we're just dealing with the args. And so that leaves us with the blocks and the element to deal with. So if we dive in on what this component return type is, which, oh, I can't do that from the pop-up, can I? Yeah. Um, so this is going to look familiar. We have two magical symbols this time instead of just one. Uh, but otherwise, this is basically the right. same thing as we did before. So we're saying, OK, this thing has some blocks that look like this, and it has an element or also possibly not. Mm -hmm. uh, not in and I mean, of itself a very exciting type. Notably, those, just for everybody who, you know, might be less used to the shenanigans we do with symbols, just a quick refresher. Those lines 28 through 30 up above, we're declaring a bunch of totally made up symbols, element, modifier, and blocks. And then in the case of a component, we're saying this has blocks and element uh, versus the modifier return, which just has, hey, this is a modifier. Uh, so again, totally made up symbols like we talked about last time that have no runtime impact, but allow the type system to keep track of what we're doing here. Exactly. So we jump back and OK, so hi is a function that gives us a component return, just like everything else that has this invoke symbol that we talked about last mm -hmm. time. It's a function that gives us back some kind of return value. For a helper, that's a real value that we can actually do things with. For a modifier, that's modifier return. For a component, that's component return. And this component return doesn't do very much of anything, like I said above, <laughs> because we don't do anything in that component. We don't even have to declare a signature for it. So if you remember from when we looked at emit element last time, we did the same sort of thing here, where we figured out what the element was and called emit element rather than emit component, and then got this little gamma back. Mm -hmm. And little gamma is going to look very similar to the one we got back from init element. It also has an element key on it, but unlike that, it also has a block params key. And this is going to be a mapping from block names to the types of the parameters that come out of there. So as we dive into slightly more complicated components, you'll see that we actually do things with these two. 
But as is, all we've done is call init component, and all init component does is, OK, you need to give me something that looks like a rich component return in some sort of shape. We don't actually care about the details of what's in there. Right. And then we're just going to basically turn around and do the opposite of what we did, bundling these things up in the symbols and pulling them back out into things we can just directly reference. So we pull out the element, we pull out the block params. That makes sense. Maybe this is a good time, as we're about to dig in a little bit further, um, you, you've got Gamma and Kai. It struck me as I was reviewing back through the last recording that we, we mentioned that we had these. We made jokes about the fact that I want to pronounce things like they were pronounced 2,500 years ago. Uh, but but why, why these Greek letters? And yep. why Greek letters at all? But also why these ones in particular? Sure. Um, Greek letters at all because I needed something I could find in the symbol map. <laughs> on my keyboard fairly easily. Um, yeah. These equally could have been like emoji or something. Um, but honestly, I, I like the version of use it. That's all em emoji dot whatever, emoji dot emoji. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, I spent a little bit of time looking at the ECMAScript spec for things that were valid identifiers, but unlikely to be people things people use. Mm -hmm. Ultimately picked these. Um, if we were being slightly more rigorous about this, we would do a little bit more in-depth analysis of the template to make sure that we're not clobbering names that anyone is truly using in their template. Today, right. if you try and call something capital gamma, you probably get into trouble. Might have a bad time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that said, no one has actually complained about that yet. And I'm genuinely a little bit surprised about it. But regardless. <laughs> and um, isn't, it's, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, so Akai, I think I just picked because I needed something for the library. Mm. variable and was like, yeah, that's a squiggly X, sure. <laughs> the gamma is actually something from how we model programming languages. Um, it's a whole other topic that we really don't have time to go too deeply into. But in general, this capital gamma represents the context that a given expression is being evaluated in. That's generally going to include like the variables that are in scope. It potentially mm. can get fancier and include a bunch of other kinds of stuff as well. But like in general, you can think of gamma as what's in scope at this point in the program. And so we haven't actually gotten to what we do with big gamma yet. Um, but spoiler alert, it's what's in scope when you're inside a component <laughs> template. Right. Um, and so from that, then you go with little gamma, and that's what's in scope in a particular block inside a template, whether that's cool. the innards of an element or the innards of another component. That makes a lot of sense context. And so if you see this in a CS paper, now you'll know, oh, gamma, that's the same as the glint gamma. No, glint gamma is the same as that gamma. But now you know. Yeah, I wonder. Turn style, is that what that's called? I don't know. I should not waste time <laughs> on that. There is a whole like family of notation that deals with this big gamma and how you stick mm -hmm. things into it and find things that are in it and stuff. So Coming back here, uh, let's make say hi slightly more interesting. Let's import the component. Which I'll comment as an aside here that we're actually getting a glimmer component when we write template only component. It's not a glimmer subclass. But it is a glimmer component type, not a an ember component type, despite the fact that we get it from ember component template only from a type perspective, et cetera. The reasons for that are uninteresting historical things. But just in case anybody's wondering, I actually had a colleague get confused by that exact thing about a week ago. So I wanted to call it out. Your template only component is not an ember specific kind of component. It's a it's actually a glimmer component that happens to come from this weird import location. So this changed nothing, but we now are asserting to TypeScript, hey, this takes no args, it has no element, it has no blocks, mm. rather than letting TypeScript kind of just assume that. And that actually might be worth, let's go look at the IR. Mm -hmm. um, way over here on the right. So if we look <laughs> at template expression, we specifically assume here that mm. you were giving a component that does none of these things. We like. There is a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, I think, in the community in general about what this equals does with a type parameter and when you should <laughs> or shouldn't give things default values. The answer is probably that you shouldn't. But mm -hmm. 
what it really means is in the case where TypeScript can't figure out literally anything about what your type is supposed to be, this is what it should fall back to. And for template expressions, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to say, if you have just gotten this big right. empty function body that has nothing to give you any clue about what's actually happening here, here's what you should fall back to. And so this is how we tell it. The default thing you should do without any type information is pretend this is a component that has an empty signature. Similarly, we'll talk about what a template context is in a minute, but we have a similar kind of like eh, empty, 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 empty default here. So coming back to that, um, let's make this not so empty. Let's give this... Arguments. I should stop using this word because I'm going to. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I should also just stop using the word excited because I think I'm going to type it every single time. Exited. But, You're going to type exited. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, why is that there? Did I do that? Ooh, on purpose, but I'm glad I did. Um, so what we've said here is this is a template-only component. Now we've added a signature to it. Now we are allowed to use excited in here. And we can also pass it through. Notably, we didn't have to because Dan made it optional there on line four. Correct. If I undid that, that. Add. Go back to the IR. It's to become time to talk about gamma. But let's come back down here first, because this is mostly revisiting stuff we've already seen. Just like we had yesterday with helper invocations, now that mm -hmm. we're passing named args in, this is a final object argument that has excited true. And then we splat the named args marker in to once again indicate that this is something that we're using the special named arg syntax for. This isn't just an object that happens to be right. a final parameter. Right. Um, but otherwise, this works exactly like helpers and modifiers did yesterday. So if we come up here, we see for the first time we're referencing this big gamma. And if we mouse over it, we can see it has type component context, null, and then some args. And I guess that means that. That's a signature? I don't know. I don't remember how we actually derived this. This will be fun to go dive into. <laughs> yes, everyone, you're hearing it live. We <laughs> implemented all of this, but we don't always remember all of the details of this. And it's not just us. I was on a call with the TypeScript team last week working through some performance issues, not Glint specific. And they were all sitting there going, wait, how does this particular thing work? And then nerd sniped themselves into exploring in the TypeScript playground, just like we do all the time. The, Sufficiently large programs, you can't keep them in your head. So let's figure it out. <laughs> what did we do, Dan? Better. And drill back on template expression. Because now we've offered TypeScript a type to make these mm -hmm. things adhere to. So we're no longer going to do the stuff on the right-hand side of these equals. Instead, we're going to infer a signature and a context. And yeah, OK. okay. I sort of remember how these pieces fit together. So. Invocable instance we've seen before. Um, this is the thing that makes something callable or invocable in a template. Every helper or modifier component is going to have an invocable instance on the right-hand side of a constructor expression somewhere. Uh -huh. Or it's going to be a function in the case of helpers. Um, has context. This is the new bit. So if we drill on this, you're going to be super shocked to see that once again, we have <laughs> generated an imaginary symbol and we're just sticking some arbitrary type data behind that symbol. So let's actually look at what an any context is. It's just a template context with a bunch of any's. So we'll follow this chain down. So this, args, blocks, element. These are the four pieces of information, we should not hover over things, that you need inside the implementation of a component to know mm -hmm. what's a do. You need to know what this is. You need to know what args you've received. You need to know what blocks you're allowed to yield parameters out to. And you need to know what type of element you've promised. And so we do something very unexciting and just take those four things and then stick them in an object type where each name matches each type. And so if we come back here, we had in our original template a reference to 
the excited arg. If mm -hmm. we expand that out, we can see that that became gamma.args.excited. And so by setting up the type for our template only component here, we've not only described what its invoke looks like so that we know what's allowed down here when we mm -hmm. use it, we've also set up its context, which declares the type of this gamma. And so over and over again in all different gam or all different component templates, you're going to see gamma dictated just as much by the signature as the invoke is. The bit that gets a little bit tricky with this, since we're doing all of the nitty gritty on this, uh, let's go to integration declarations. Is this, so I talked last time about how we are generally using instance type of these public things to declare how something can be invoked. And for helpers and modifiers, that's the whole story. There's nothing else to it uh -huh. because they don't have an inside to deal with. There's no inner part of a helper or a modifier right. that is defined in a template that we need to have special types for. Those just exist in TypeScript and they work like a function. For a component, we do need this second piece. So this part of that I've highlighted here covers what does it mean to call this component from somewhere else. This is the bit that covers what does it mean to you to be the inside of this component, to be this uh -huh. component's template. And specifically, the reason we have to do this directly on the interface by defining a context key is because we need access to the this type. Right. We need to be able to say, this is the actual instance type of the class that you've defined your template to be associated. Otherwise, with. things like this dot foo in your template just what's this? What did remember that the component context is this? Uh, we're going to pass along what this is and what args are and everything else. And if we don't have this here. And it has to be specifically here. We can't actually get access to those. Uh, you can get access to public properties outside the class, but if there are private properties, if there are uh, hashtag private properties, which the previous version of the template tag transform and classic Glimmer compo or uh, HBS files can't access, but a future version of GTS files will be able to access it. You couldn't look at it here um, because you need to be inside the way TypeScript enforces this, this, the word this, ah, <laughs> uh, the way TypeScript enforces its checks on what is accessible when you access something using the this keyword to match what is accessible from a JavaScript perspective when you access the this keyword. Uh, it actually has to be in the context of the class or something merged with it via interface merging like this, 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 this. And that, this is a little bit of a tangent, but that's actually one of the few things that still separate type declarations from interface declarations is interfaces are allowed to talk to about this. There is a notion mm -hmm. of this with an interface. If this were just like an object type literal, that we right. would have a squiggly under this here. Right. So you'll see that we use export default interface everywhere, not export default type component equals something. Yeah. So, and what you were just talking about, about access to this, I think leads pretty cleanly to the next thing we should look at, which is what if this weren't a template only component? What if we just said that uh, class say hi extends component. I should have pulled this out into its own interface, but instead I'm just going to do that. <laughs> okay, that uh, is technically valid code. Mm -hmm. So, not the recommended from... authoring format, but you can totally do this. No. Yeah, we'll fix it. <laughs> Yay. So from an external perspective, this works exactly the same way as it did before. Mm -hmm. It's the same signature. Nothing has changed. However, in here, now if I type this, I'll be happy about that because this is not something that I can just send it to the DOM. But if we look, the type of this is the say hi mm -hmm. class. So let's take a look at the IR. We have a little bit of talk to do about what's happening with the boilerplate. This will be the first time we've seen the other form of boilerplate that a template can have. Mm -hmm. But first, I just want to talk about this. So, um, as expected, we're talking to gamma.this, and 
before we talked about how the type of the template, like we imposed a signature on it by saying const say hi colon template only component with the signature equals template expression. We don't have anything that we're assigning this to here. This is a effectively a side effecty function call here mm -hmm. happening in a static block for the class. So if we look over to the right, we're no longer calling oop, too far. Oops. Scrolling is weird with the zoom on. <laughs> We're no longer calling template expression like we have been in every other example we've looked at. Mm -hmm. This is now template for backing value. And specifically, the backing value is this, where in the context of a static class block, this is the constructor for the class. And then we have the same thing we saw before, a function with sort of an implicitly typed gamma, and then this library type that has everything else on it. And so if we dive into template for backing value, mm -hmm. This is going to look similar to how we defined resolve. Um, we're saying, OK, it's some args, and there's something that looks more or less like a valid context. Backing value needs to be some kind of constructor whose return type has this context symbol on it. And that's all we actually care about. This is all just sort of like a little bit of type acrobatics to pull out this context type, and then just turn around and say, OK, that's going to be the type of gamma here. and I'm not actually sure why we've typed that as returning something. That's an interesting we should... question. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, you know what? I think this is for Glimmer X support. Because in Glimmer X, I think we use this same mm -hmm. DSL construct, but we you assign you assign like static templates oh, right. in Glimmer yeah, X. You do and we static need template some type to get back there. So yeah. that's what's happening there. And the key bit here is this backing value that we use to get the context out and understand what does this mean in the template? What does args mean in the template? And so on. And maybe it's worth digging in very slightly here to how we do that. The If we look at what has context is again, which we looked at this just a minute ago, but I think this might be illuminating. All we're doing here is saying, okay, here's a type that has this T bound to context on it. So when we go back, and this is a trick we use in a number of places, if we go back to that uh, template for backing value here, what we're actually doing is using that to relate the backing value and the body. So you can see that it has backing value is this function which produces something that has that context type on it. The context type is therefore something TypeScript is tracking through from the type parameter for template for backing value has that context. We say it's the one that comes along as the return type of this constructor type for backing value. And now the body pipes that through to the gamma having the type context. Dan said a minute ago that it's sort of implicitly typed as context. This is how. TypeScript can see that, oh, you passed me this thing which produces something with a context of type context. Okay, in this body then, we don't have to do something that names that, which is important because naming it would be difficult here. Instead, gamma automatically gets that. And then chi is never. Why is chi never, Dan? Uh, chi is never because if we look back over here, we always explicitly annotate it with some other type. And never can be any type. That's no problem. Um, I actually played a bit with... We always call template for backing value or template expression hanging off of some empty object that we've cast to be the library type. Mm -hmm. And in principle, that should mean that we ought to be able to kind of implicitly grab what that type is as the this value for this function and plumb it mm -hmm. through over here and not have to annotate it each time. But I found in practice that weird things happened when I tried to do that, and it just didn't seem worth trying to hunt down. And so we just always mm -hmm. stick the second annotation here. Yeah. So never is the bottom type which means anything, it, it is a subtype of everything. It's the opposite uh, and you of you can never one. construct one, yeah, mm -hmm. which is the safe top type. And we could, in principle, use any here. So why did you pick never over any? Um, that's a good question. Seemed better. In general, I think fewer any's. Like, I only am going to use any. You'll see it pop up here. We talked about like that any yeah. context type. Yeah. The only place that I tend to use any when I'm constructing types in TypeScript is when I really only care about sort of the shape of the thing, where mm -hmm. context is a 
great example of I'm not worried about the variance of the specific types throughout that, right. like all the different keys in there. All I care is that like those keys are defined and I'm going to pull them out and use them in ways that their variance has the right implication. Right. And so using any is an easy way of avoiding having to play variance games in the meantime, because okay. as soon as you have extends some type, you, the type checker is going to start reading in a lot of information into what that means. And right. sometimes particularly with things like Glint, where we're plumbing a lot of type information around in kind of a cheating way where we really just need to get <laughs> point A to point B and then we're going to do something meaningful with it. It's easier to just use any. Uh-huh. In cases other than that, I tend not to. So here, I very explicitly want to say that like we're promising that this value is whatever type you want to be. And that's uh-huh. that, like, you noticed that that was never, you called that out. And that's exactly what that never is meant to be there to do is be like, okay, something strange is going on. This isn't just a normal function parameter. Right. We will not dig further into variants and function subtyping and all the things that get into play here today. I'll add a link to that in the notes. Look down there. There, It's down there. Uh, but the, the key here is that covariance, contravariance, invariance, etc. These are all things that from a maintenance of the internals point of view, we do actually have to get right because uh, in lots of cases, we are very specifically dealing with function subtyping. And therefore, the reason this has to be a bottom type here, this never, is because it's a function argument. And so if you want to pass another th- a thing, which is assignable to body here, because body is a function, and for it to be a valid subtype of body, you have to be able to assign anything to that second argument there for it to be legal. Again, I'll link you to other materials that explain why, but it's important that you see that that is actually the case here and we are keeping ourselves honest about it versus in the very few cases where you'll see the any's. And in general, this is the correct way to type something like this. You don't see it often even in definitions of like any function uh, because Again, it's hard to keep track of, and you have to do extra work, and ah, oh, there's any, and it's often easier, but worth knowing and understanding that that's what's going on here. So now we can keep moving forward on how this actually works. As long as we're on the topic of heady things that are strange about functions, um, I was about to call this out, and I had time to read this note that I left for myself. <laughs> it's very helpful. Yes. And now I remember that in addition to the Glimmer X use case, there is a very specific reason that this isn't just unknown or something and that it's a constructor type. So you may look at this oh, yeah. and say, yeah, yeah. why do we define args here at all? Why don't we just mm-hmm. say args unknown? And why isn't this just unknown? Right. And in fact, for most things, that would work just fine. Generally speaking, this has the same behavior as the thing we had before. We're saying, okay. This is some kind of constructor. It might take args. We don't really care. Like I said, all we actually care about is that its Uh instance type has this context symbol on it. And similarly, we don't really care about the return value here because we're only ever calling this as a side effecty sort of function and we're discarding it anyway. But TypeScript does not, in general, support a thing called higher kinded types. And the 30 second version of this is that in JavaScript, Functions are a first class value. That means Uh that you can pass functions around as a value and then call them somewhere else. And that's pretty normal to us in many, many modern programming languages, but was in fact kind of unusual 20 years ago. 1995. Yeah. Almost 30 years, Dan. Oh, man. Yeah. (laughs) I'm not going to think about that too hard. Um, This notion of higher kinded types is sort of the type level equivalent of that. So like, for instance, I have this has context type. I can't ever pass has context by itself. I always have to pass it around applied to some other type. Uh And I think I just didn't even know I could do that. I shouldn't. Um, In general, that's not a big deal. For the most part, you tend to know what you're trying to apply things to. Um, Where it gets tricky is when you are trying to sort of treat types more like functions. And a key case where that comes up is, for instance, components with type parameters. So if I undo all of that and make this a T, I don't really know what I'm doing with this value T. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. This is the easiest example. Yeah. So we're just okay. gonna yield it back out. So we need to introduce a type variable t here to say hi, and we need to plumb it through to the signature. All of this is covered in the docs and hopefully something you've seen before. Uh -huh. Get rid of this because that was never legal. And now we'll just say yield value. When we put that some value in. And fine. Okay. So we've passed in a number here. If we check this, we can see TypeScript has figured out that that is indeed a number, which is good. That's what we want. Indeed. We have treated say hi like a value there. Uh -huh. Because we had to. We pass it into resolve because we have to generally deal with arbitrary values in, in all of Lint. We don't know that they're necessarily a constructor or anything. So somehow we need to be able to say with resolve, let's once again put this out. We look at what this has turned into. The function that came out the other side of say hi kept that t type parameter. Right. And it propagated it through to value t there and to value t in our block parameters. And that's what we needed to have happen because the only way for TypeScript to understand that passing a number here means that this thing down here is a number is for the resulting function that we get out of this oops, to maintain that t. So if we go back to resolve, um, we, oh, we came at this the other we direction. We came around but, from the other side, yeah. Yeah, resolve does the exact same thing. Um, mm -hmm. This is the same phenomenon sort of across the board where we're like pulling out the args and returning this uh, this is a slightly nastier version. It was nicer where we were looking before, but <laughs> it all comes down to the same thing. Right. Um, the only nice thing about where we were before, so we'll talk about this. In pull request 3215, the TypeScript team implemented a very limited form of handling of things that sort of look like higher kind of types. Very specifically, if you call a function that accepts a function or constructor and returns a function or constructor. And not only that, but you specifically have type parameters for its arguments and its return type that you also use in the, in the input and the output. If TypeScript can notice that there is a type parameter on the input, it will try and figure out how to bring that to the output. Um, so they're probably worth just doing a very simple. Uh, No, I'm not going to generate one of these. <laughs> it's really hard to, yeah. It is, it that, is. That Components set of rules, are actually though. one of the easiest ways to talk about this. Yeah. But the it is that is, set of rules, though. The yeah. type parameters on the input for the, re the arguments and the return type, and then returning the same thing, uh, returning something that has both of those. Then it will preserve, it'll do its best to preserve them. It's not like you're not. That there are cases where you can make TypeScript fall down, but as a rule, this is the this is the trick. Mm -hmm. And the trick here is that like we don't actually need to necessarily like the input and the output don't need to have quite the same shape. You can trigger this behavior as long as you have mm, yeah it's a constructor or a function and yeah this is a constructor or a function. And if you look in Resolve, actually, um, we do the exact same thing where we pull the mm -hmm. constructor args off of your component class or whatever, and then do nothing with them. But what mm -hmm. matters is that we asked what they were. And that's what's important to trigger this behavior of preserving your type parameters. If we took that out, suddenly things like each would stop working. No, no matter what you passed in, you would just get unknown out. And so this really is, I would, it's worth reading. This is a long PR with a huge mm -hmm. description and a lot of back and forth over the details of the behavior. And they've tweaked it a little bit. The original version, I think, didn't actually cover constructors. But this is where this functionality was initially introduced. And if you're curious about it, it's a good read. And understanding this is key to a handful, like template for backing arg and result, mm -hmm. backing value and resolve within Glint relies on this specific behavior a lot. Um, it's also useful for more general, just sort of like, higher order yeah. functional programming like people like to get into. But yep. in our case, sorry, go ahead. 
I was going to say, and uh, it explains a behavior that I see people trip over often, specifically with that, where you're dealing with higher order functions. And it seems when you're just reading those, like, well, why doesn't TypeScript keep track of this? It seems like it should. And if I just, because the normal rule with generics is if it only appears in one place, you're doing it wrong. This is the one exception to that because it triggers this behavior. Uh, but you should still generally follow that rule. If you only see generic ap appear one place in a signature uh, for a function or whatever else, you you should take it out and just use the type directly in, in its place. The case where that is not true, and the only case where that is not true, is where you're trying to trigger higher order function inference. Uh, and again, this is just this one special case because it's a very common pattern in JavaScript. So, I mean, that's the story right there. Here's a, TypeScript is, here's a special case because it's a very common pattern in, TypeScript, in JavaScript. Uh, and it's very nice and productive, but also it means you have to learn, oh, this case is where, where to break that rule, that heuristic. So now we understand why T doesn't go away here. And I've ruined the rest of the stuff by using T, so we're just going to leave it in there. <laughs> uh, we can talk about the important bits. We covered args earlier. We talked a little bit about mm -hmm. this. The first time we had a yield, we yielded just to the default block, not very exciting, and just a single value. But this is a new DSL function we haven't seen before. So if we look at it, it cares about the context of the component that it's in. We're passing in gamma there. And then it cares about the name of the block, which is our second arg. And it gives us back a function that expects whatever the appropriate parameter types were for that block. Because at the end of the day, that's what a yield more or less is, is you've passed in a block, that's basically a callback. A yield is basically calling the callback. Mm -hmm. um, and that- Major hand wave around basically, but it, for the type checking purposes, it is the correct thing to give TypeScript yes. to do here. And again, this is one of those things that we mentioned in both of the first two, but especially the first episode where we were digging through is in the case of Glint, we don't care what the runtime behavior is so much as we care what is a way to present a view of this to the compiler that will give you useful, accurate diagnostics about what you're writing here. Uh, because again, Glimmer is a different programming language than JavaScript is. It happens to be embedded in JavaScript and to interact in interesting ways with JavaScript, but it has different semantics. Semantics of yield look most like, for the purposes of type checking, a function call. Which is to say they look most like what yield does in Ruby rather than what right. yield does in JavaScript or Python. Right. Um, so if we dig in on the actual definition of this yield to block, you can see it wants a context, it wants a key that is valid for what the blocks are in that context, and then it just constructs a function out of the parameter types from that block. Um, most of these methods you'll find are by themselves not that exciting and do roughly mm -hmm. what you would expect to do. Uh, it's just how we piece them all together in the end. And in particular, like we turn this thing into a function because, again, that's effectively what yielding to a block is. And so that's going to give you the most familiar feeling diagnostics from TypeScript when something goes wrong. If you're yielding parameters that are of the wrong type, you essentially want that to look like calling a function with parameters of the wrong type. And so we've yielded out value to our default block here. We come down here. So this I typed myself. This was not generated by Glint. So we did this thing we talked about before we emit component. We get little gamma out, we emit a reference to it so we don't get spurious errors, and then we create a new block scope. So anything inside here only lasts for the duration of these curlies. And I'll talk a little bit about why we do it this way in a minute, but first we should finish the story on blocks. So we already looked at how our little gamma has this block params thing. It, TypeScript doesn't like to flatten this one out for reasons I've never fully understood. It always prints it as required flatten block params, blah. But the gist is that the thing that comes out is uh, mapping from block name to a tuple of value mm -hmm. types. And so we had, oh, this is, no, we're not going to go back to that. We had <laughs> Too far. as value. So we, we pulled out a single block param from mm -hmm. that. And so we're destructuring a single block param here. So we pull that out here. TypeScript knows it's a number, but we go through the same resolver return, emit content, all of that song and dance that we've done before. Um, then the component block closes. We emit a second reference to say hi. Specifically because say hi appears twice in the template, 
And so we want mm -hmm. things like rename operations to apply to both the opening mm -hmm. tag and the closing tag. And so when we're mapping locations, this is the close tag for that component. This is the open tag. Um, you might wonder, given that doing stuff with blocks is essentially sort of like callbacks, why this doesn't look more like uh -huh. default uh, value. Essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, people have explicitly asked this. So it's not a hypothetical that you might wonder it. Um, we'll ignore all of those red squiggles because obviously Ben doesn't expect you to do this. But this is actually a couple of versions back of the DSL. Mm -hmm. This is how we did it. It made a lot of sense. Um, you know, you get things like your scoping for free. Mm -hmm. The problem is, as an example, if you've ever used the array for each method in TypeScript. Mm -hmm. If you do any kind of narrowing behavior before you call for each, like you're checking the type of some other variable or whatever, and then you want to reference it within the body, that narrowing goes away. And you kind of can look at it on the surface and be like, well, okay, TypeScript should just know that for each calls it immediately. And so nothing could have changed and that narrowing should still apply. But TypeScript can't know that, short of like somehow special casing that in the language or, introducing fun things like Rust does, where you can actually know that this function is invoked immediately before, mm -hmm. before the thing that you've handed it to ever comes back. Right. Um, Linear short of types, that, everybody. Yes, exactly. Short of that, TypeScript can't know that any of your narrowing still applies inside the function body as it did outside the function body. And what that meant was that if you had like an if to check if a value mm -hmm. was set or not, and then tried to use it inside the body of a component or an element or whatever, that thing would go back to being nullable where you were trying to use it. And that was obviously wrong and also very frustrating. Right. And so what we eventually did is that, OK, yes, we think of blocks as callbacks, but we really can't emit them that way. And this is the point this keeps coming back to over and over. And I think this is really like the key example of where we've done this, yep. is we had to say, OK, you know what, TypeScript can't. We can't tell you that this callback is invoked immediately, so we have to do something else. And so what we do instead is we make it clear that it's invoked immediately. We pull these values out into a variable and then make our own block that, from an execution perspective, looks like it just runs in line immediately. Uh -huh. um, and you might say, OK, but like if the variables are consts, then your narrowing will last inside. And that's true. But then if you start talking about, OK, but what if you have a field on an object that you're referencing? Suddenly, right. you have to go make that a read-only field to be able right. to have narrowing work on it in your template, which seems a little wild. And it goes further and further. You yeah. can kind and of it doesn't, it doesn't map more. to what, yeah, it, it doesn't map to what you would write or what you would intuitively expect in writing TypeScript because you don't have to do that. What Dan just said, the example of going and making a read-only field on your class, you don't have to do that in TypeScript if you're using it for narrowing. You can just be like, oh, this is, is it the kind I expect or not and get the behavior you want because of how control flow analysis works in TypeScript. Um, so again, we want the behavior here to be what you expect. And I think actually maybe something we can do here to illustrate that further, Dan, is show narrowing right here, which is probably what you're in the middle of typing. <laughs> uh, well, mainly I just wanted to get back to templates instead of real DSL, templates. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. How? What's going to be the easiest way to do this? I wonder. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to come up with an example on the fly for yeah. something we can uh, narrow. I mean, we can just actually make value be uh, or undefined and do an if for the value there, right? Or something uh, like sure. something to yeah. that effect. Look at that. Here we've got value of string is or undefined. Mm -hmm. We can say this value. Now within this value is just string. We know it's not undefined. Right. If we use the callback approach, we even were using it for elements at that point. So doing this suddenly value right. would be or undefined. Right. Or so, you put this inside like a link to or anything right. that has a body, right. you suddenly lose all that narrowing behavior. Right. 
And maybe it's helpful here to see the IR again to see how this translates into exactly that same dynamic. So we get the emit component with the little gamma context. Then we start the block just like we did before. And this if value happens inside that block where the context is fixed. Now we can do emit element and have a new little context and the value type gets passed through and plumbed through. So we can do our emit content there with the value. And you can see that by having these blocks and a fixed context per block, we now have the ability to actually emit what we need to, to get you what you expect to keep narrowing in place. And that wouldn't be true if we were doing the call, you know, the here's a callback form yeah. like Dan showed a minute ago. Which we figured out by painful experience. People's one one other thing I want to say here is people's intuition is not wrong. It was our intuition. <laughs> it was exactly what we started by implementing, uh, and we figured it out by implementing and be like, oh, well that sucks. That doesn't work. Dang it. Okay, what do we do instead? And I say we. It was basically all Dan, but it was and and really useful feedback from the community of hey, why doesn't narrowing work here? Mm -hmm. <sighs> oh, it doesn't work there. You're right. How do we fix that? So, yeah, I think that was maybe the first big, like, oh, we need to rethink this bug mm -hmm. that we hit after opening Glint up for public mm -hmm. consumption. So uh, we've talked about this. We've talked about blocks. We've talked about args. Let's quickly hit element just because there's not actually that much to say about it. And then we can move on. So uh, I don't know why I picked table. That was not a great choice. <laughs> so we say we stick our attributes on a table element. We do that here. If we then, or it's optional or not, so I'm just going to leave things there. Um, we're just going to pass things. Let's look at the IR. <laughs> Remember oh. last time we said arbitrary attributes are allowed on HTML elements. We just yep. ripped it. So we have init component. We're getting little gamma out. And we see apply attributes. And this is something we should be familiar with. We looked at this yesterday okay. with just how regular DOM elements are emitted. And in fact, this is literally the same code path as sticking attributes on a DOM element. Because in both cases, you get little gamma, and it has an element property on it. So from Glenn's perspective, we don't care if it's a component or just a regular DOM element. We're just saying, mm -hmm. okay, it's the thing that is little gamma here, and we're going to apply attributes to it. And similarly, the exact same story works for applying modifiers. We just say, yeah, it's the most recent block we entered. We're going to apply some modifiers. Um, so there's really nothing else to say to that. It works exactly like elements do. Um, but it's worth calling out that it works exactly like elements do. And I think with that, we have essentially a grand unified theory of invocables in Glint. Mm -hmm. Everything turns into a function that takes some positional args, possibly some named args, and then returns one of a variety of values, either just something mm -hmm. plain for a helper or some specialized things for modifiers or components because you can only use those in specialized ways. And one note here, we could show this or not, but if we passed a modifier there, it would do the exact same thing as we showed yesterday. It would be x dot apply modif or emit modifier, um, passing apply modifier. to the apply modifier. Yeah, passing the element and the relevant arguments, and does it pass or not? Exactly as if you're applying it to a div directly, rather than if you're applying it to a component that accepts it. Yep. And you get the same type checking behavior out of that when you do it on an element. So if the element's null implicitly or explicitly and you pass a modifier you're going to get an argument you get to get a type checking error that says you can't do that and when you see this in this specific error in your glint code that's what it's telling you is you don't have an element we might think about that's another one of those uh error messages that's very recognizable that we might think about yeah that's actually remapping. what i was just going to check i really thought we had a custom message for that. That's why I was going back to the template version because I mm. thought we were going to see a diagnostic bump here, but apparently not. What if you make it null instead of implicitly unknown? I'm wondering if it's how we're mapping a signature and it's only handling it for no. Oh, we specifically turn null into unknown. We turn there. null into unknown. So yeah, we could yeah. use a, an error mapping. A whole other topic. We'll get there. Yes. 
next time. Um, or time after. Soon. One of these days. But so we have a beautiful grand unified theory of what it means to invoke something in Glint, whether it's a component or something in Curly's. Except if you've been paying close attention, sort of like yesterday, uh, it's all lies all the way down. <laughs> because here we have if, and that's a thing that like, in principle, you could probably model as an invocable thing in Glint. It mm -hmm. takes a single positional parameter, it has two blocks, a default and an inverse, and we totally could model it that way. Like we could go through the exercise right now of saying like, here's the signature for if. It wouldn't be very exciting, but we could do it. But, but there's a problem. We don't actually want that, right? Um, <laughs> if we define if that way, then all of that wonderful stuff we just talked about with narrowing working exactly the way you expect from TypeScript won't work. There is no way in the TypeScript type system to express the thing that if does. Right. Um, similarly, there's no way to express the thing that and does or or does or a variety of other structures. Mm. Uh, you also may have noticed yesterday I used the hash helper. And if you look very closely at the template, there was no invocation of you know, resolve hash, blah, blah, blah there. It actually did just translate to an object literal. And the reason for all of these things is that TypeScript has very specialized behavior around things like object literals, things are like conditionals, things like Boolean operators. Right. And so we went through all of this trouble to define here are all of the things you can invoke in a component and then have to sort of walk that back for these special cases where actually we there is language level stuff going on that we can't just emulate in the type system. We need to use that specifically. And so here, for instance, if we look at, you know, we've got this if, if we show the IR, that is actually admitted an as an if. Um, so we call these special cases something called special forms. And that's terminology that we stole from the Lisp community. Um, the idea is that most Lisp languages are actually at the core very small. And a lot of things that in any other language would be built in syntax are in fact just macros or functions on top of macros mm -hmm. or functions on top of macros or functions. And when you get down to the very base, you have these things called special forms. And those are things that look the same as any other Lisp or ma macro or function, but in fact mean something special to the compiler. And that's essentially what we have here. If and, and friends look exactly the same from a sort of high level perspective as any other helper or component invocation. Granted, they're a little weird. You couldn't implement if, I guess you could do it as a component with a custom manager that took a position yeah. and blah, 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 yeah. but um, you wouldn't really want to. But we want the special behavior. And so we can look at, go to, is this where we define special forms? I don't, probably should have known the answer to this before. <laughs> Mm, let's special form. Well, here's a list. That's a good starting point. Mm -hmm. So we have a specific list of these are the things that Glint knows are special. Um, and we don't actually say what those have to look like in a template. We just mm -hmm. say that in general, these are the special things that exist. Things like conditionals, things like yielding. That's another one that we looked at yield. Right. It looks just like a normal curly invocation, but obviously the thing that we translate that to wasn't a normal curly indication. Right. right. Things like object and array literals. Um, we'll come back to bind invocable. I promise component <laughs> hell and we will have component hell. <laughs> um, and then things like Boolean operators, equality, mm -hmm. anding, oring, not. Um, and we care about these for exactly the same reason we care about if, is TypeScript has a lot of nice built-in understanding of if you check that something is truthy or if you checked that a field is present in a given object, or if you defined a custom function that returns a type assertion, right. these operators compose those assertions together such that anything inside your conditional knows all of that information. And that's something you just can't do in the type system. The only way to have that happen is yeah. to use these operators directly. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, talk, we'll start here with the config. So we've talked around the idea of Glint environments. Mm -hmm where an environment is sort of the type of project that you're using Glint in. That might be Glimmer X, that might be sort of classic Ember, that might be Ember template imports. In the future, that might just be like Ember Polaris, where everything sort of comes together out of the box instead of being fired today, like the template import stuff is. And so different environments declare different things. And that's actually pretty useful because, mm -hmm. for instance, like we have hash and array in uh, 
Ember Loose, but in GlimmerX and in Ember Template Imports, those are not just like global things that are available. You right. have to import them from somewhere in Template Imports. And in GlimmerX, I think you just like write functions. I don't think there is a hash or array built into GlimmerX. I think that's right. Um, and so each environment declares special form config. It says, okay, here is the set of global special forms, and here is the set of special forms that you can import from a given path with a given identifier. So if we go look at imports, uh, this one probably, yeah. yeah. We have this special forms declaration. And we say, okay, here are the ones that are globals. We have if, that's if, unless functions <laughs> as if not, uh, yield, and then component modifier helper will come back to. Um, <laughs> the hell is coming. Yeah. And then on the import side, you from Ember helper import array and hash, and those function as array and object literals. And you'll notice there's a bunch of splatting going on here as well. Mm -hmm. People do fun things with like template macros where they add a custom transform that works ahead of time. Um, or they use things like Ember truth helpers. And you want to be able to say, right. this is not strictly true, but it's close enough to true that Ember truth helpers and looks like the and and operator. So right. this gives you a way when you're configuring your environment to say, just assume that and works like the and and operator. Yeah. And it's probably worth saying here, it has come up even from folks on Framework Core asking a reasonable question of like, look, does this distinction that Dan just alluded to where Ember Truth Helpers is close, it's not identical. Like, does the distinction in semantics really matter that we need to jump through these hoops? And our answer to that is yes, because we... Well, the way to think about it here is, number one, we never want to tell a, a real lie. We've joked, joked for the last couple of days here, the last couple of videos about everything being lies all the way down. But the way we think about this is these are lies that are attempting to actually tell the truth about Glint. We are making all of this up, but we're making it all up with an eye to saying, here is a an actual, accurate, truthful representation of Glint in a way that makes sense to the compiler accurately and gives you useful diagnostics accurately. And so what we don't want to do ever is tell you this thing is type safe in a way that is a lie, that is going to cause something to blow up at runtime. And at the same time, in the case of something like Ember Truth Helpers, where a direct mapping of Ember Truth Helpers and or etc., the actual if you go look at the actual implementation of those, it's not the same semantics as uh, JavaScript and Ant. Uh, Handlebars truthiness semantics in general are not the same, and so we have to s try to balance. How can we give you truthful answers here in the template? where we're not going to promise you, yes, this thing will always be defined if you've checked here by using and, and then you end up with an error at runtime, well, you're immediately going to come file a bug on us in Glint, and you would be right to do so. And also, very similar to the TypeScript team itself, we have a fair bit of pragmatism here. We want to be able to say, look, you can choose to opt in, and if you choose to opt in, using these special forms, using the ability to say, look, Ember Truth Helpers is close enough for my purposes, and if it blows up, that's on me. I accept the responsibility. I used that knowing that there was a small, shows up 0.02% of the time difference, and I got a runtime error in a place where Glint promised me it was safe. But I opted myself into that behavior, so I understood what I was signing up for. That's the balance we're walking here. If we get to a point where we rationalize in one way or another, Glimmer template syntax semantics to actually match here, well, then we won't have to do that. And a straightforward path you could imagine there is if we adopt something like HTMLX or a Svelte-like syntax where you have embedded JS expressions, but we just get that for free then. We don't have to write an EQ helper or a mapping for an EQ helper. You just use, you know, if brackets, foo, equal, 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 bar, and hey, TypeScript just gets that for free for you then, and we wouldn't have to do this dance. And that's kind of my hope of where the community goes long-term on this, but I think it's important to give that context of we're trying to ourselves always tell the truth through these lies, 
And then in the case of something like Ember Truth Helpers, give you the ability to opt in and say, look, I, I understand that in these rare edge cases, it could actually bite me. I'm willing to take that trade off because it's extremely useful to me. Fair. Yep. So I think I have avoided as long as I possibly can. <laughs> it's time. We, everyone I think is likely familiar with the component helper. There are also corresponding modifier and helper helpers. Mm -hmm. These things in loose mode Ember allow you to dynamically look up components. And in both loose and strict mode Ember allow you to pre-bind arguments before invoking one of these things, such that when you invoke it down the line, it doesn't need those arguments to be defined. Deep for these arguments, everyone. that like, mostly makes sense. For positional arguments, it gets very hairy. Really wacky. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you might guess, and you would guess correctly, that representing all of that magic pre-binding, particularly in light of the fact that we might just be starting with a string that represents the component in the first place and not the actual component class, gets hairy. And so we implement these three helpers in terms of a special form called bind invocable. And what this actually means is the first argument that each of these things receives is special. And it needs to go through its own sort of pre-processing, essentially like, yeah, this thing, maybe it's a value, maybe it's a string. Essentially like run that through resolve for me and then we're gonna do, go do a bunch of tech yeah. mechanics on top of it. And so I guess the best thing we can do is just an example. Let's simplify it, say hi back down. Oh, although in principle, we made that work. I'm more likely to type of things with that. So I'll just do. <laughs> don't need any of that. We don't accept blocks anymore. So say hi. It's a component. It requires a Boolean arg called excited. If I take this out, it work. It's angry. There's nothing there. All right, here we go, everybody. Component. Let's start with just say hi. As. Hey, it works. So, We're done. Yeah, we've done nothing really interesting here, <laughs> other than wrap say hi in this component constructor, but otherwise it's the same component as it was before. Mm -hmm. However, now that we've done this, suddenly cited is an optional argument. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you'll notice there are several things going on here. <laughs> um, oh, I haven't even talked about globals. We'll get to that. Let's just assume that like let works the way you expect it to and dive straight on down to components. Yeah. Globals aren't complicated. When we get to them, you'll say, oh yeah, that makes sense. No big deal. Um, Although that'll be an interesting discussion around environments too. Well, and I almost hit that already, but I didn't want to keep procrastinating on talking about <laughs> So let's... What a noble, noble impulse. Mm -hmm. I sh man, this is uh, that right now. One more for him. So that's our let stuff. So now we are resolving the component helper. So let's uh -huh. just go ahead and say let component do that. And then we're calling component with. Once again, I've got to stop and remember how these things work. Why is that angry? Mm -hmm. There's a parenthesis, so, missing parenthesis. There we go. There we go. OK. Um, we're calling component. And you'll remember this originally looked like component say hi. Sorry. Like that. So the excited equal true part, there's nothing shocking going on here. That's the same way we apply named args everywhere. This thing is a fun little adventure. <laughs> so we, there are a couple of things going on here. First is this resol resolve for bind method, which is maybe one of the last methods we haven't seen in the DSL. Uh -huh. It's a fairly late addition. Um, this works a lot like resolve. 
But the difference is it understands things like strings. So if we go look at it uh, in Glint template, it's not very exciting, relatively speaking. Um, it works more or less the same as Resolve does. Um, it has some slight variations around what it expects in terms of nullability because things work slightly different with the component helper, but it's generally going to be the same pattern of we're looking for some args, we're looking for a thing that's an invocable instance, we're pulling out the instance type and then playing the games to make sure that type parameters are preserved and reconstructing an output type. Um, so in that respect, it's essentially the same as Resolve. If we go look at Ember, oh, Ember loose MX. No, that's all what we want. Probably. Yeah. So, in this mode, binding helpers <laughs> accept not just actual invocables, but also their string names. So, now things first off, interesting. <laughs> so what direct invocables? I skipped over direct invocables last time I realized. They're not very interesting. Essentially, in user space, anything we do with a direct invocable, you would just do with a function. Direct invocables, instead of having an instance type that has invoke on them, they are just a value with a direct invoke symbol. The reason we need this is to be able to have things that have multiple signatures. This is stuff like link to, where yeah. there's a version that takes a positional parameter and there's a version that takes just named args. And you can try and do type gymnastics to represent that in a single signature, but it's nasty. It goes badly. Um, yeah. So. We can't just use functions for these things because in all of the Ember versions we support, we can't just assume that functions are necessarily callable. Right. Uh, right. That would actually change if we dropped some older Ember versions. But for the moment, this is basically just an internal way of saying this thing looks more or less like a function, but it's not invocable like a function if you get your hands on it in user space. Right. Um, so then we have this looks again just like regular resolve. It's something that has an instance type that can be invoked. It's slightly worse than regular resolve because we need to handle both the case where the thing you gave us was nullable and the thing that you gave us wasn't. Because unlike regular sort of top level invocation where it doesn't really matter, either if the thing was null, then nothing happens and that doesn't change uh -huh. anything from a type perspective. But with the component helper and the helper helper and so on, those it will does. happily just take yeah. null as your value and give you null back, which I have thoughts on, but it's reality, so we're stuck <laughs> with it. Um, so you'll see we have duplicate versions of all of these. The only reason we don't have that for direct invocable is because we know that our direct invocables are never null. Right. Um, then we have handling for plain functions. And we have these last <laughs> delicious ones for strings. So, OK. I guess we get to talk about globals one. now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to run through this and hand wave globals, and then we'll go dig in on them a little closer. Essentially, if you give us a thing that looks like it's the name of a global, First, we check if it's invocable. And if so, we pull out the thing that is invocable. And we check if it's direct invocable. And if so, we pull out the thing that is direct invocable. And finally, we assume that you've stuck a function or something in the global registry, and we're just going to give that back and hope for the best. Um, and in fact, that technically could happen if you're using, you know, if you have a helper file declared somewhere that just exports mm -hmm. a function, yeah. put that in your registry, then there it is. Um, and then we have the same thing, except if it could possibly nullable, then the output can also be null. So I think this is probably the gnarliest single function in Glint. Mm -hmm. There might be others, but this is this is the one that's changed the most. Um, and this is only half the story, because <laughs> all this has dealt with so far is turning that first string or value argument mm -hmm. into a regular Glint function. We still have to deal with all of the parameter binding. So let's talk about that. And then we'll circle back to globals because that'll be easier to sort of wrap up with. Yeah. So if we come back here. Ah, <laughs> there's also this last thing where we don't just call resolve for bind directly in line here. We wrap this whole thing in an immediately invoked function expression. And the reason for that is to influence the directionality on uh, TypeScript of inference. Types inference. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, the parameters passed to a function are mostly sort of their types are resolved in order. So things that are left are going to influence the type of things on the right. However, that's not 100% true. If there's ambiguity in the type of the first argument or any of a number of other things are going on and you get concrete information in the second or third argument, that can propagate backwards. The issue with things like the component helper is what that mm -hmm. means is if you pass the wrong archetype, 
instead of telling you, hey, excited was supposed to be a Boolean, not a string, you'll get an error message that's like, I couldn't look up a global that wanted excited as a string. Right. Check your Google. <laughs> and that message makes no sense. Right. And so it's it's wrong. Because your your intent is I want to invoke, say hi with excited. And TypeScript telling you, I don't know what this thing that takes excited as a string is. You're like, what? What? Yeah. what are you talking about, TypeScript? Exactly. And so wrapping this in a function expression that we just immediately invoke essentially acts as a wall to that inference and says, no, you need to infer the most concrete type you can for this thing and then move on to the rest of it. And so it just gives you, it puts error messages in the right place. Otherwise, this is... If you've dealt with errors with the component helper, you know they're nasty anyway. They're much, much worse without that wrapping function. So we've done all of this. Let's go look at component. Um, not very excited. Component keyword, OK, which itself is just a bind invocable it's no keyword. no big deal. Bind invocable keyword. Surely this will be yeah, fine. No big deal. It takes a number as a type, and then also this thing. Seems totally reasonable. Actually, that seems uh, a little weird, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so component return probably makes sense here. What we're saying is whatever the thing is that you're resolving this to, it does need to be a component. You can't use mm -hmm. the component helper to resolve a helper. Maybe you can. You shouldn't. I know that they've resolved down to the same primitive under the covers, but I, there's maybe some guards there. I'm clear. Yeah. Anyway, so. um, this other thing is the number of positional parameters we should skip when you try to pre-bind positional parameters. The reason that matters is specifically for modifiers, because they always have the element as their first parameter, and you can't pre-bind over can't them. bind it, yeah. So if we look at the modifier helper, that has a one here, and it gives you back modifier return. And if we look at helper, it's a zero, and zero. Any, because helpers can return yeah. whatever. This is only, it's only 96 lines to describe what you do. It's not so bad. Okay, I lied. This is actually the worst thing This is far away, far and yeah, away the worst. Um, um, yeah. I'm actually going to start here by saying this form confused the heck out of me the first time I looked at this file. What we're looking at here is a series of function overloads in an interface declaration. So that this structure where you just see basically a bunch of type params followed by a signature and then a closing, like a, a semicolon there. What we're seeing is basically overloads. You can always write a function as either a type alias or an interface that has this shape that Dan is writing here. It's a little weird, uh, but it, it's really important that that works because this is JavaScript. Functions are objects. You can slap other properties on there if you want, and it'd also be callable. This is this is just JavaScript. It's crazy sometimes, but uh, the crazy eyes I'm making right now are appropriate for JavaScript, folks. So this form is basically the only good way to write this actual thing that we're doing where we need to map these uh, type params down into a set of overloads. Right. So here we go. If you want to define the type of a function that has multiple signatures, this is the most direct way to do that without defining a dummy function and then taking the type of that. So. Right. So, man, I hope I remember how all these things work. <laughs> Legitimately, there are a couple of things in here that I'm sure made sense at the time, and I think I wrote pretty copious notes in the PR, and we mm -hmm. have lots and lots of coverage in the tests for making mm -hmm. sure that these types work correctly. You, there are very few characters in this file that you can change without breaking a type test. <laughs> um, yep. But that said, I, well, it'll be fun to see if I can remember what each of these is doing. They generally come in pairs. Once again, we have the nullable mm -hmm. version versus the not, which makes this twice as bad as it would otherwise be. Um, for the shorter ones, prettier also does things like, no, invocable goes up here versus invocable goes down there, mm -hmm. which makes it less obvious that they're pairs. But right. basically, we have a comment with saying, this is what this corresponds to ahead of each pair. And then you can look at that and kind of work backwards. So as a reminder, we have called uh, resolve for bind. And so the first argument for this is a function in the form that Clint expects all of its invocables to be. It's positional, maybe named, and then a return of uh -huh. some type or another. So 
if you call, for instance, the component keyword with just the invocable, like we did with say hi at the beginning there, we're matching on the function, and we give back an invocable that has that signature. So we've basically yeah. resolved for bind, unwrapped it, and now we're just wrapping it back up and saying, this is just a regular invocable. It works like everything else in the system. We do the same thing there, accounting for nullability. Next, we have invocables with only named args. And you got a little bit of my thoughts yesterday on the interaction between named and positional args and how painful that makes some things in the system. Very specifically, this is one of those things that is uh -huh. painful in the system because it's really hard to tell sometimes which argument you're necessarily trying to pre-bind because there's ambiguity, particularly with just plain functions as helpers. Right. Um, so all I'm of these sorry. are <laughs> all of these are attempting to sort of hint to TypeScript. And so what you'll see we've done is we've specialized very specific common cases to make sure that the inference does the right thing. Uh -huh. And then you sort of get to the most general case down at the bottom and hope for the best. So here, this is specifically to handle the cases where you are just binding named args. This thing doesn't take positionals, um, which is distinct from the case where it takes positionals, but you're still only binding named args. Uh -huh. So here, we have an invocable. It specifically takes named args. It's not just a function helper that takes some sort of objecty thing. Right. And man, this inference is awful. So we are binding both a type parameter named and a type parameter given named. Mm -hmm. So named is what the thing expects. Right. Given named is the set of those that you gave. And so it's our say hi, for example, it happens to be the same, but if it took an additional named argument, like what, I don't know, um, doubly excited or something, um, then we could see that the named and the given named would be Different. So here, name oh, yeah. is this will do it. excited boolean. Given named is going to be just an empty object. Right. Um, this is very specifically crafted to get TypeScript to infer the right actual values for named and given named, um, because these things get pretty hazy when you have optional args and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so we want to we want to constrain this to not have keys that aren't on the actual name. We don't want to let you pass random extra things in. But we also still need to capture the specific set of args that you passed in. And so this incantation accomplishes that. Um, <sighs> now we can see pre-bind args. Mm -hmm. Oh, before pre-bind <laughs> args, we have maybe named. Oh, yes. So yes. the thing we get back is an invocable and Seems right. maybe named. What's that? I said in the invocable part and the return part seem easy. But yeah, now that part's easy. It's just these lines in the middle. Um, so maybe named is what accounts for the fact that once you've pre-bound all the required named args of a type, you no longer have to pass any named arguments at all. So what that ends up with is, we can see in the preview without even drilling down there, if we do some work and check and like nothing is required, then named, you can still pass it. You can always override named args, but it's no longer a required parameter. So you don't right. have to invoke this with named at all, which we saw. Once we had bound excited true, we didn't have to pass anything in. Otherwise, if at least one key is still mandatory, you must pass named args and it's a failure not to. Then we have the magic pre-bind args. So this takes as a parameter the nullability just crops up everywhere. You'll see that this is just sprinkled around like, yeah, this could have been null because someone did something weird. For the purposes of our types, it's never nullable. We're just talking about this thing, sort of the platonic ideal of it. So it takes the set of required named arg or the set of named args that your invocable expects, and then the full set of keys of things you gave intersected with the set of keys of things that are allowed. Yeah. And in principle, given the way we guarded this above, requiring it to be partial named, there should never be anything in key of given named that's also not in key of named here, but due to sort of the limits, limits of TypeScript's long distance inference propagation, that can't be known. And so you'll see we like over and over here, we're just always ending that together. The actual operative piece of this type is key of given named. And so what that's doing, we can draw, drill in, it's not the best, but it's not the worst. Positionals are worse. Um, we can say, okay, Prebound args are named args because the only way to prebind args is dealing with the component helper. So even if you started with a 
function that didn't require these things to be passed as named args. Once you've pre-bound named args, you've turned it into something that only works in a template. So we take our input type and we omit whatever args we are passed, and then we and that together with a partial version of whichever args were passed of the main <laughs> thing. The effective outcome of this is if you pre-bind an arg, it doesn't disappear, but it becomes optional. And mm -hmm. that's what this is doing. And that's important because the final invocable thing here needs to be, okay, I have all of the args that are required. So if we do this, so we're still allowed to say excited true. Uh -huh. We can even change that to excited false, or uh -huh. we can leave it out entirely. Uh -huh. um, that's oh, what we have to cover all of those cases. That's what prebind args is doing. Is it saying, okay, this was given. Now it's optional. It still has to be a boolean if you do specify it, but you can get away with not specifying. Uh, this is the same thing except nullable. Handles nullable. Yep. Right. Um, All right. Now the really bad one. <laughs> One really bad well, one. one of the really bad yeah. ones. <laughs> there's only after this. There's only the general case, which looks very similar. Um, and I couldn't actually tell you any more why specifically we broke these two apart. But uh, if we take one of them out, we can go see which tests fail in that. <laughs> um, so this is just the more complicated version of what we did here, where it only uh -huh. accepted named args. Now it accepts positional args, but we need to find named args hanging out at the end of that argument list, essentially. Um, and then, honestly, the rest of this actually looks fairly familiar. Uh -huh. um, we're still only taking named args. We do the positional. We make sure that we do everything we did before, except we're splatting out positional ahead uh -huh. of the maybe named. And once again, we're handling nullability with the second version. Finally, we have this one, which I can't quite fit all on my screen at this. No, I can. OK, there we go. Perfect. Just barely. Yeah. Um, so this is the case where you have also tried to pre-bind positional args. And in general, if I see that in a PR, I question why we have a component or something with positional right. args. But the system lets you do it, so we account for it the best we can. Um, this is the place, I think, where you're most likely to run into things like type mm -hmm. parameters disappearing, because we really are going deep into munging things around in the type system here. So here, you'll notice we're not actually specifically looking for named anymore. We're just saying this takes a bunch of args and was given a bunch of args. Mm -hmm. And we have slice to and slice from, and we can go look at those in a second. But the gist is we're just saying, OK, if you're a modifier, we're skipping the first element thing, because that always sticks around. But then we're chopping out yeah. however many yeah. positional args you passed. and keeping the rest, and then doing the same thing in a nullable way. So slice to some, some uh, tuple magic here. Yeah, tuple magic. I've got to see if I remember how this even works. <laughs> Basically, it's a recursive type that says, given an index, um, does the length of the array that I have, the tuple that I have, match that index? If so, I've got it. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, recurse and do the exact same thing. I'll say, okay, I'll get the rest of them and a tail, if there is one, um, and go ahead and slice down and just recurse on this. This is actually a very standard recursive function. It's exactly how you pattern match on lists in things like Haskell or Lisp or anything else where you're recursing through a list, linked list or something like that to get it, except we're doing it with types at the type level. Right. And slice right. from is basically the same thing, but the opposite. It starts uh -huh. at that index and gives you everything after it instead of giving you everything up to that index. And that is bind invocable. And I recall now that I think this is documented somewhere. Um, if you want to bind both positional and named args, we suggest uh -huh. you do it with two invocations. Two of invocations. Component I'm sorry. Or helper or modifier. Yeah. That's bind get positional you... first and then yeah. named second, I think, right? I think so. Um, yeah, or vice versa. Better. I don't know. I do basically. We, second, but yeah. yeah but basically, why are you doing this? <laughs> well, maybe do something else. Maybe break that apart. Our best here, but don't do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. We saw bind invocable. That's yep. pretty impressive. So now we can pop the stack and 
all the way see back how to this, yeah. Monarch Globals, I think, is where we landed. Yeah. This is going to be a nice like cup of ice water after the, the heat of hell. Yeah, this is, this is the nice sort of smooth taper at the end. Yeah. Um, so, actually, let's go back for a second. Sometimes we refer to things like say hi, and those are in scope outside of the component. And sometimes mm -hmm. we refer to things like component or let or really say hi, and those don't exist outside the component. Right. And really say hi, we can look and go, actually, that does exist in scope within the component. That's something that was defined within this world. But things like component and let got to come from somewhere. And so when we look at the IR for this, we can see that we treat those as strings. And there is, once again, just pulling off the DSL type, there is a thing called globals. Uh -huh. And anytime in strict mode, we see an identifier. Actually, so I should say, this is something that works differently between strict mode and loose mode. Strict mode assumes something is a local unless it's told otherwise. Um, and so if I just say, like, foo here, I'm going to get a red squiggle because we just emitted a reference to foo. Uh -huh. In loose mode, I would also get a red squiggle there, but we would have instead emitted a reference to globals. Right. So the question then becomes, how does it know? So, like I said, in loose mode, we just assume everything is a global. Unless it's been introduced via a block parameter or it's hanging off of this or args or something, mm -hmm. we're just always going to emit a reference to globals. For strict mode, you might have noticed this if you had eagle eyes. So I'm just going to go find it again. Uh, <laughs> imports, index, here. Yeah. The list. We say, OK. Here are the things that are globals. If it's not on this okay. list, assume it's a local. So this is all of our built-in things that will look familiar. It's also anything that's been declared as a global special form has to go on this list. And then same with being able to declare custom special forms. You might be doing magic with the template compiler to make things have extra syntax that doesn't actually exist right. at runtime. So you can add those to this list as well to keep it from emitting a global reference, or to force it to emit a global reference, rather. This has to be specified on a per environment basis because different environments have different ones of these. The most obvious being GlimmerX has many fewer of these than Ember does, mm -hmm. and just period. Like it doesn't have mute, it doesn't have a bunch of these other ones, it doesn't have unbound, I think, et cetera. So, um, oh, I was going to look at the list of Wibbles for Ember Loose, but there is no list of Wibbles for Ember Loose. That's the entire point. We can look at the environment definition for Glimmer X, exactly. Mm -hmm. But it just has this set of things in theory. Um, and so based on that, we decide whether we want to, how many things do I open over there? <laughs> so many. Yeah, apparently. In a reference to this, I know, globals. And so if we dig in here for, Ember template imports, we have what's going to look like a very familiar list. And that's because Ember template imports, we talked about this a little bit last time, is uh -huh. defined in terms of Ember loose. Uh -huh. And so what we actually do is we import Ember loose's globals and say, OK, of those, here are the ones that we have. Because there are certain things that do go away, like hash, right. for hash instance. Hash or array. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we say, OK, um, our actual global value, the thing that we can reference here, is all of these keywords plus anything that's on globals. And if we actually go check that, this is just an empty thing. And this is the type level counterpart to what we were just talking about with that additional globals array uh -huh. that you can set up for the build, which is, OK, you promised me that this global existed. I'm going to go try and access chi.globals, whatever that key name is. Here's the type that needs to be def defined there. And this probably looks familiar for anyone who's operated in the Ember Loose environment, because this is the fundamental way that we operate there. Rather than calling it globals, we call it the template registry, because mm -hmm. that's how everything works in loose mode. But if we go look at Ember Loose, uh, let's... Oops, there we go. So we have a globals type, just like we did. Mm -hmm. It extends keywords, which are defined up there and whatever the registry is. And that's our sort of public extension point to say, yeah, 
your components, your helpers, your modifiers, whatever. These are all of the things that are available in the template. You throw those in. And by adding that to this global's interface, that is how lookups actually work in a loose mode template. Um, we can probably drop this now, actually. Ooh. I think this predated the existence of special forms, and we did mm, things a little bit makes sense. So we yeah. still have entries in these lists, um, but we could drop them today. And so if you're curious, you can actually go through here and see, like, OK, how is the concat helper implemented? Uh -huh. And that's a pretty it's uninteresting one. It's just a helper like yeah. that takes any number of positional arcs and turns them into a string somehow. Um, but there's lots of interesting things. You, hmm, this is another one. It's not as bad as. Uh, just this one is overloads. much simpler than component. Yeah. It's just a lot of overloads. And, yeah. and it's exactly what you would expect. It's it's just you can preload with a whole bunch of args and right. off you go, with the exception of those first two that Dan has highlighted yeah. right now. Um, so we do have the mute helper, and that works specially with the function helper and with the action helper. And so we do account for that. When you use mute, we hand you a thing that basically looks like a cell that mm -hmm. function knows what to do with. The rest of these are basically doing exactly what we talked out about a half hour ago of, OK, we need to format this function in a very specific way such mm -hmm. that if the thing you give it has type parameters, TypeScript will persist those. And so that's what all of these overloads are doing. If you actually do hit this final clause here, where we have arg extends unknown dot, 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 if you really want eight plus parameters or whatever the count is there, um, that's when things will sort of fall over and you'll yeah. stop getting the type parameter propagation. But anything up to that, this is functions in such a way that um, TypeScript will hang on to those for you. Now, does this predate the fully generic uh, tuple spread handling that landed in, I think, TS 4.1? Um, or could we back, like, back align it to that at this point? It does predate it. When that came out, I looked at whether we could use the fully generic tuple spread stuff there, and it, it lost type parameters. So we ended up yeah. having to keep this. Um, OK. The tuple spread stuff is really nice, but it specifically doesn't trigger their like higher kind of ah, There we go. Yep. And that's probably where we ought to cut yeah. things off, because I think anything else that we dive in at this point would be a whole new can of worms. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that seems good. Thanks for walking through all of it. People really got a, a good deep dive this time. We've got an hour and a half today. Uh, and I don't think there are any good places to chop that in half. But so given what we've covered so far, where where do you expect we'll go next? I think what we should probably do next is talk about the actual mechanics of the transform process. Mm, um, yeah. Which is not there's not a lot of depth to go into in that. It's just a lot of the same kinds of code written for all of the different constructs in a template. But yeah. I think it's worth covering. Um, and in particular, we can tie that to what we just talked about with environments and how they specify here are the globals so that that process mm -hmm. knows whether to emit one thing or the other. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we can kind of keep stepping backwards in the mechanical process of generating code to type check and look at the rest of the core. Um, right. I'd love to I say mean, that that can all be a single video. I'm not going to promise because I also <laughs> thought that everything we just did over the last two would have been a single video, but mm. um, yeah, we'll see. And then I think maybe the last one we'll do along with, again, mailbag. If anybody's gotten to this point in the video, uh, send us questions if you have them and we'll try to answer them. Uh, it's also kind of look at the wiring with the CLI and the language server and all of that, which will kind of wrap us through the, the overall chunk of the system. Thanks for watching, everybody. Subscribe. Like us, follow us. We're awesome, right? How many people give you this kind of in-depth content on YouTube?